Hi class. We're going to read pages 51 to 61. And I can't wait to find out what's going to happen. It's kind of scary, but it's interesting at the same time. And to think that not exactly the things in this book happen, but similar things happened. It's really amazing. So, 8.15 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. So a.m. is in the morning. Wednesday, April 18, 1906, the Travis's Block, Sacramento Street area. So we're back at the Travis's. Mr. Travis has thrown himself from the doorway. Flames rise from his clothes as he lies in front of the burning house. Henry is scared, but he is not a coward. He crawls forward over the shaking gown to his father. It is hot by the fire. Steam rises from the wet cobblestones. Roll, Henry says, and helps his father put out the flames on his fiery clothes. When his father sits up, his hair is curled and the tips are singed, tiny bit burned. Once Henry wanted to be like Marshall Earp. Now he wants to be like his father. Did you notice? That's how Chin feels too. They're both learning things about their father that they never knew. The two houses are now one giant hill of rubble. A bathtub sits upon a section of roof. Whoosh! Fire shoots upward. The flames are as tall as Henry's father. Sparks fly like fireflies. They dart onto the roofs all around. If only the firemen would come, his mother says. Henry turns in a slow circle. There must be even more fires all around the city. To the south, he sees large pillars of smoke. More rise to the east. Chinatown lies that way. Chin lives there. I think they're even busier now. Mud and soot streak Mr. Travis's face. He and their other neighbors decide that they cannot rescue their homes. They can only try to save what's inside. Our house looks so rickety. Should we really go inside? Mrs. Travis asks doubtfully. Mr. Travis takes out his flat wallet and flaps it. We'll need money. You stay in the street with Henry. And he disappears into their house. Mrs. Travis hesitates. Then she tells Henry to wait for her. She goes inside too. Henry feels lonely standing there, so he follows his parents into their home. If he helps, they can get out faster. <clears throat> Henry hears a hiss and looks for snake. He can't for snakes. He can't see any in the kitchen, but he can smell gas. The pipe to the stove has broken. His mother looks at him angrily, but she does not scold him yet. There is no time. Together, they dump food from the pantry into baskets. They add some dishes, silverware, their pots, and a frying pan. Mrs. Travis finds clothes in a hamper. Ah Sing was going to wash them, but she takes them now. Then they stagger to the front door. Mrs. Travis pauses there. She takes six umbrellas from one of the ceramic stands. She hooks them over her forearm and leaves. And your forearm is this part of your arm. Six umbrellas. Mr. Travis is already outside. He is very mad when they come out. Mrs. Travis nods at the small chest in his arms. We'll need more than the money that's in there. His father grunts that she is right, but we don't need umbrellas. Mrs. Travis clutches them. You never know when they'll come in handy. What if it rains? I hope it does, Mr. Travis says. It'll put out the fires. He goes back inside. He changes into regular clothes. Remember, he's wearing his nightshirt tucked into a pair of pants. Then he comes out with an armload of broken sticks. On his head, he wears several of his wife's hats. The top one has a big ostrich feather. Despite everything, Henry and his mother cannot help laughing. His father looks silly. 
Mr. Travis dumps the wood down in a pile. Then he takes off the feather hat with a flourish. So, Madam, he says, and presents it to Mrs. Travis. We don't have a roof anymore, so you'll need this to protect yourself against the sun. He puts his dusty top hat on Henry's head. Sorry, I didn't realize I was bumping. He hides half of Henry's face until he, t it hides half of Henry's face until he tilts it back. His mother holds up a stick of firewood. It is polished, fine grade wood. Is this from your mother's Chippendale? She asks her husband. A pile of bricks smashed it, Mr. Travis says with a shrug. Henry knew it was an antique and valuable. It had traveled from England and around South America to reach San Francisco. We might as well get one more use out of it. Mrs. Travis goes inside. She changes quickly. Henry and his father break up thin pieces of veneer for kindling. So sometimes when furniture is made, um, they'll pay, take an expensive wood, a rare wood, and put thin, thin pieces on top of a less expensive wood. And that thin wood on the top is called veneer. They are careful not to get splinters. Down the block, the two fallen houses are hidden in flames. The fire is so hot, they can feel the heat from where they stand. Henry's father lights their cooking fire with a burning stick from the huge pile. Mrs. Travis is dressed in regular clothes when she comes out again. She hefts a frying pan from the kitchen utensils they saved. It won't be as good as Ah Sing's, but it will have to do. As she works, she hums an opera melody. While his wife is busy cooking, Mr. Travis sneaks back into the house. He drags out his new easy chair. Easy chair is just a really comfortable chair. Other people carry more of their things out of their homes, too. Except for the fires, it is like an outdoor party. One family has, car has carried out chairs, table, and a sofa. They arrange them just as they were inside their parlor. Parlors like a living room. Another has brought out their new bedroom set. After an hour, the street is filled with furniture. A neighbor waves hello from her rocking chair. She sips tea from her best china. Henry feeds a piece of ham to Sawyer. As his tail wags happily, the Smiths come by. They have piled many things into a baby carriage. The fire's spreading. Mr. Smith said, a third house is now on fire. This whole block's going to go up in flames. We're going to my cousin up in Sausalito. That is north across the bay. But what if their house is gone too? Henry's mother asks. We'll keep walking. Eventually we'll find something, Mr. Smith says grimly. We're done with San Francisco. Well, we're not, Henry's father insists. A cheer goes up from one end of the street. The army's here. A squad of soldiers tramps towards them. Henry has never felt happier. He starts yelling. He feels safe now. However, the soldiers don't stop when people call to them. As they pass, Mr. Travis says, Hey, we've got fires to put out and people to rescue. But the sergeant shakes his head. I'm sorry, but we can't help you. We're watching for looters. The soldiers march away and Henry's shoulders sag. The whole street is silent except for the flames. Mr. Smith grips the handles of the baby carriage. You're a man of sense, Travis. Save your family. Get out now. He pushes the carriage along again. Henry jumps when they hear shots and they all turn and look. Did the soldiers catch looters? Henry asks his parents. I don't know, his mother says. But God rest their souls if the soldiers did. You may know this, but looters would be people who go in to steal things from stores and other houses. Almost always when there's a crisis. That's usually the only time that you see people kind of going crazy. 
and just grabbing things. So same time, 8.15 a.m. to 10.30 a.m., Wednesday, April 18th, 1906, Chinatown. The earth dragon is restless. He tosses and turns on his bed beneath the surface, and more buildings have collapsed in Chinatown. Smoke hangs over Portsmouth Square. Everything looks hazy. Even so, Chin can see new plumes of smoke. Some of them rise from the direction of Henry's house. He thinks again of the firemen without water. We should make sure the Travises are okay, Chin says worried. With his son's help, Ah Sing gets up from the grass. He tries a few steps. I can't walk that far, and you can't go there alone. They're probably already leaving on a train, Ah Kwan says, and so should we. The fire is spreading. Think of your boy. Isn't he one of the reasons why you came here? Chin's father bites his lip. I just sent my salary back to China. Can you loan us money? Ah Kwan pats his empty pockets. I'm broke too. A hundred dollars? That's piracy, a man shouts from across the street. A merchant in an expensive robe, robe is arguing with a man on a wagon. The driver spits on the cobblestones. Then you can watch your stuff burn or be crushed. There's plenty of others willing to pay. The merchant pulls at his little goatee. Okay, but you take me and my family too. Aquan nudges Ah Sing. I see our train fares. And he yells to the merchant, Hey, do you need help loading the wagon? The merchant stares at Aquan's big arms. You're hired. Aquan pushes Chin forward. My partner, too. He's too small, the merchant snorts. He's small but powerful, Aquan insists. I only work with my partner. The merchant throws up his arms. The world is full of pirates, but he gives in. 10.30 a.m., Wednesday, April 18, 1906, San Francisco. Fireboats and a Navy tug join the battle against the fires. They pump salt water from the bay. But in the southern part of San Francisco, many little fires merge into one big fire. The trouble seems far away from the neighborhood of Hayes Valley. After all, it is near City Hall. The firemen are nearby. They are putting out the two small fires. Everyone else thinks the area is safe. Last night, there was a roller skating carnival at the Mechanics Pavilion. A few hours ago, costumed rollers, roller skater, skaters played there. Now it is an emergency hospital. Injured people cover the floor. A library has been threatened by the fire in another section of the city. So it has sent 200,000 books to the pavilion. Among them are many priceless manuscripts. Nearby, a woman's children are hungry, so she starts a fire in her stove. She will cook ham and eggs for them. Flames rise from the wood in the stove. Smoke and sparks rise up the chimney. She cannot see the break in its mortar and bricks. Glowing embers flit from the chimney. They land on the roof. Soon, her house is on fire. To the west, a strong wind races in from the ocean. It sweeps over the rolling sand dunes of western San Francisco. It races through the tombstones of the cemeteries. Stronger than ever, it fans the flames on the woman's house. The fire swells and swirls. Cinders spread outward like fiery seeds. Most of the fire companies are fighting the flames elsewhere. There are not enough firemen in Hayes Valley to handle this new danger. Soon roofs everywhere are filled with burning flowers. Houses, stores, and churches disappear in flames. The firemen are helpless to stop so many new fires. All they can do is retreat. 
Behind them, they pull their wagons and hoses. Higher and higher, the ham and egg fire grows. And that became its nickname because that's how it started. It rears up like a giant monster. A tongue of flame licks its fiery mouth. It is surrounded by so many unburned building, buildings. It picks out its next meals. Then it sees the two other major fires. One is to the south of Market Street. It is chewing on houses and skyscrapers. The other feasts on warehouses in the east. The ham and egg fire stretches out one arm east and the other south. It will join its brothers. So a couple of things to notice that this author does is he makes it sound as though the fire is actually a living thing. When he says it reaches out an arm this way and reaches out an arm that way. But of course we know that fires don't really have arms, uh, nor do they have brothers. Um, this is called personification, and writers use it to make their writing more interesting. So Lawrence Yep is imagining that the fires are actual living beings, just as the earthquake is an earth dragon an actual living thing. Um, so as you're listening throughout the book, you need to realize um, that this is just uh, a tool that a writer uses and not actual truth. And um, I will read more next time.